All right, guys, we have the third in our series of political policy related panels this morning, and this is the one that I have been most looking forward to uh, because I think it gets to one of the issues that everybody in this room has been, uh, has been thinking about, uh, everyone in the country has been thinking about, and the one that no one in the country was thinking about. Uh, we talked about a little at this conference a year ago. Uh, the year before that, no one would have bothered or thought it was an issue, and this, uh, and this uh, is the issue of uh, Russia and social media. We've had some discussion at the panel at this conference already about this, but this is a panel designed specifically to talk about it. Roger McNamee's over there. Everyone in this room knows who he is. Um, the, the investor uh, uh, famed for his investments, now famed for having abandoned his investments to become an evangelical crusader on this issue. We will talk more about that in a minute. Uh, Laura Rosenberger, who uh, with Jennifer Palmieri worked at the Clinton campaign, uh, and now is involved in a variety of things, but m most interesting for us here, uh, tracking the activity of Russian trolls, bots, and Russian-related uh, social media actors who are doing bad things to our democratic discourse, and uh, Renee Duresta, who's the like, biggest brain in the academy, <laughs> thinking about uh, these dynamics in the world of social media. So thank you guys for all for coming here. Um, I wanna start uh, and just go, and I, I think I'll, I, I'm gonna start with, with you, Laura, on this question, I just want to ask this, right? We even before the Mueller indictments came down, we we said we were going to start this panel by sort of saying, okay, what do we know uh, at this moment about what happened in 2016? I'll ask in a second about what's going on now, but I just want to look at 2016 because obviously it's a huge issue in our democratic discourse. Was the, the what what was, what did Russia do in our election? We don't know the answer about collusion. We don't know a lot of things, but we now because of all of the discussion we've had over the last year or so, and particularly now we look at the Mueller indictment, which has a staggering degree of detail, we now know a lot more about what Russia was doing in the realm of social media to try to influence the election, both in favor of Donald Trump and in favor of just discord, uh, than we knew even two weeks ago. So I just want you to just talk about that. Right now, the state of our knowledge about what happened in 2016 with Russian social media is? Partial and scary, but I think still not complete. Right. So what I would say is a couple things. One, um, a year ago, I think there were a lot of people who suspected that there had been an enormous amount of activity on social media coming from Russia aimed at influencing the political discourse in this country. There were people like Renee and her colleagues who had been doing a lot of work on this actually um, for quite some time and trying to bring attention to the issue. Um, but in the past year, what we've seen between the congressional investigations, between the Mueller indictments, is an enormous amount of information about the use of fake accounts, fake personas, bot networks, political advertising um, that was used to try to influence the political discourse around the election. But I would just make a couple points, and I know that we're gonna focus the conversation here on the social media piece of it, but one thing I think that is important is sometimes we hear a lot of conversation right now about well, did this really change the outcome of the election? And how do we know if it actually influenced things? And I think it's really important to bear in mind a couple things. One, um, the, the social media activity was one piece of a broader toolkit that Russia was using to try to influence our politics, so discord, et cetera. The Mueller indictment actually touches on a few of the things that jumped off of the social media platforms, right? Some of that's the use of just classic espionage tactics, sending agents to the United States to try to get a better understanding of our political dynamics, how they could find wedge issues, where were the right areas to target. There was the hacks of the DNC and John Podesta's email, which I know were discussed a good bit last year as well. That information was weaponized and then used and released in the social media campaign, but elsewhere. Um, we know that there are investigations of potential funding that may have been funneled through groups like the NRA that Mueller is looking into. So I think it's important to bear in mind that this was one piece of a broader puzzle where I think we still don't know the full scale of what we're actually talking about. Renee, when you, when you read the Mueller indictment, your reaction to it was what? Uh, I thought it was remarkably thorough. I was, I was very impressed with how much they managed to uh, meticulously document and put out there. I think that was something that hadn't been conveyed to the public previously. A lot of the challenge that we've had as uh, folks who've studied disinformation for uh, years now, because Russia is not actually the first, um, but as we've looked at things like the, the Mueller indictment, the sort of laying out of tactics, the you know, one thing that I was surprised by that I actually didn't know was the extent of the in-person communications, the extent of the communication. We knew there had been some communications on Messenger, but seeing the extent of them, uh, the extent of the sophistication around the money laundering operation, the extent of the um, influence they managed to have in real world, getting people to show up to protests. You know, we, we knew about one or two of those, but seeing the extent of it was, uh, was remarkable. 
So Roger, I, you know, the, the, there was, as soon as the Mueller indictment came out, there was a secondary um, a discussion that played out in social media when uh, one of the gentlemen at Facebook, uh, a, a senior executive who deals with the, uh, the ad platform, uh, came out and said uh, something that seemed to buttress the Trump argument. Say, hey, you know, I've looked at all these ads uh, that we ran on our platform. I know about this more than anybody else does. And here's the deal. Uh, these ads, I looked at them, and they weren't meant to help Donald Trump mostly. They were meant to sow so discord and discontent. So essentially, I mean, the implicit in that was, hey, you know, Trump's right. This wasn't a pro-Trump campaign. This was, there was stuff going on here, but it wasn't a pro-Trump campaign. There's been pushback on these points, a lot of it. So I just wanted to give you, like, when you look at 2016 and what we now know happened with Facebook uh, and social media, what do you conclude about the advertising piece of it and the non-advertising piece of it? So... When I saw the indictment, I actually had one question that hasn't come up yet, which is, what is the degree to which Facebook provided advertising support services to whomever was placing ads around the 2016 election? Because if you're an advertising customer of Facebook, you're entitled to all kinds of services. And you know, how did they find out about the various tools? How did all of that happen? What was the level of consciousness inside Facebook for what was going on? Because it was non-zero. So when I looked at Facebook's response to all this, for reasons I cannot explain, and it, which really disappoint me, they have approached this with a deny, deflect, dissemble strategy, as opposed to recognizing that they could be a hero in this story by accepting that their users have been harmed and that they played an unintentional role in making this happen. And as I looked at it relative to, you know, whether the question is, did all they do, the Russians do is go and sow dissent in the United States and try to drive us apart, or did they actually back Trump? To my mind, that's not actually relevant. That the fact that their tools were used in an espionage campaign is a horrific situation. The fact that they're sitting there pretending like that's okay is morally repugnant. And these are people I trusted. These are people I, you know, have supported for a very long time and whom I tried for months privately to help come to grips with what I thought was an existential challenge for the company. And I still do not understand the way they're looking at this. It, it, to me, you know, whether you liked who won in 2016 or not, this next time, anybody can do this. The platform is still undefended. And this time, all you have to do is sign in with a sock puppet named Igor, <laughs> and they're just going to blame it on the Russians, right. right? And why won't the Chinese, now the largest advertiser on Facebook in Asia, get involved in this? Why won't the North Koreans? Why won't the Iranians? Why won't you know everybody running for school board right. essentially use this platform, which is designed at its base to manipulate the emotions of the people who use it? So I want to. So you think about 2016. Now let's go forward a little bit and think about what's happened in the years since. Um, one of the things that that we see uh, is we've seen a lot of uh, activity. This does not stop the Russians and and others. But let's focus on Russia here. Has not stopped trying to play in our social media sphere uh, in 2017, 2018. Laura at 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 your uh, at Hamilton 60. What is the Hamilton 64? Uh, 68? 68. 68. Yeah, it's older. Hamilton 68. Um, you guys built a dashboard. So you can go online, you can look at Hamilton 68 at any given point, you can have a window into what Russian affiliated accounts are doing online. And you guys track those uh, in a variety of ways, but hashtags uh, are one of the ways you do it. So I wanna put a couple things up here on screen from a deck of yours. This is one, like, put up the geopolitics, uh, what, this, this, uh, this deck here, this, this slide here. This is top hashtags, we'll talk about what's on this. We're, I'm gonna show two slides just to give a sense of what you guys do and also a window, a window into things that have been happening subsequent to the election. So just talk about what we see up here on this screen. So what we see up here on the screen is actually a pretty classic take of what you would see if you log on to this website, which is a public facing dashboard um, that's tracking the messages that these accounts are pushing. Um, and I think that that's important to understand. Um, it's not saying, you know, this is the broader impact it's having on the, on the full Twitter conversation um, or that these things wouldn't be being discussed if not for this activity, but it is saying, it gives us a window into what these networks are trying to drive. And what we see here, 
and actually what we see an enormous amount of the time is that the networks will use things like a, a trending topic or a wedge issue. In this case, you see in the middle, in the purple, is Pocahontas. Um, most folks uh, will know, it's funny when I do this for European audiences, they're like, it totally does not sink in. <laughs> but when I try to explain that this is the derogatory ha uh, nickname that you know President Trump has used for Senator Elizabeth Warren. Um, but this was after one of his rants about Senator Warren using the term Pocahontas. But what we see as well then is in conjunction with that, the network is pushing messages about Syria and Ukraine at the top. Donbass is of course the part of Eastern Ukraine that Russia has occupied. White Helmets at the bottom is the humanitarian organization um, that has been working on the ground in Syria um, to try to save civilian lives and that the Russians have actually gone after and tried to smear as a sort of US CIA kind of outfit, conspiracy theory stuff. Bottom line being, they're using a wedge issue to kind of inject themselves into the conversation, a hot topic, and then promote sort of Kremlin narratives and views about geopolitical issues. Again, trying to influence the way Americans think um, about these kinds of questions. I want to get up one more slide, and then, then I'm going to move on to a different topic. But here's a good example. Before Parkland, which we'll talk about in a second, this was a fantastic example of a place where suddenly there was a huge amount of Russian affiliated activity. This is released the memo uh, in January, just a couple months ago, a month and a half ago, when Devin Nunes, the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, was uh, put forward a memo that allegedly would undermine uh, Bob Mueller's investigation, the FBI, the intelligence community, and their attempt to try to uh, investigate collusion between Donald Trump and Russia. This then happened, and this is a, a sort of snapshot. Just talk about this for one second, Laura, and then we'll talk about Parkland in a minute. Yeah, so what we see here again is um, this network deciding that a particular topic of conversation is in its interest to push. Now again, that doesn't say that this wouldn't have been a conversation that was happening absent this activity. But what it says is this Russian affiliated network decided that it's in the Kremlin's interest to try to push this particular narrative. And that we saw actually was part of a months long effort that this network has been pushing to discredit the Mueller investigation discredit the FBI, discredit the Department of Justice, and really kind of undermine those law and order institutions in our society. So Renee, I want you to talk about Parkland because there's been incredible, uh, in, the mo in the moments after Parkland, when we saw these young, uh, the families of victims and the c classmates come forward, suddenly there was this moment in national media where we were uh, confronted with uh, this new thing, uh, media savvy, emotionally resonant, incredibly articulate young voices, and then there was this counter uh, measure that, that played out in social media and in the mainstream media, but in social media in particular. I want you to talk about that because I think it's the freshest possible example of how this is happening uh, in our discourse now. It's the freshest possible example of something that happens time and time and time again. Because when we first did the uh, kind of you know speaker prep call for this, the hashtag was release the memo. Uh, right after that, it was um, the stuff about the uh, the indictments and, and then Park. I mean, this happens literally on a weekly basis at this point. What happened with Parkland was the. Um, the, the, what, what I think is important to understand is that this is a systemic manipulation problem. It is carried out on all channels. Anyone can do it. We talk about Russia in 2014 and 15. We were talking about ISIS. Prior to that, I was working on conspiracy theorists. Uh, the framework is the same. The tools are the same. The ease with which you can make something trend is the same. The ability to manufacture consensus has carried on now for three or four years. And what we saw with Parkland was the bots on Twitter, the hashtags on Facebook, the groups on Facebook. Uh, Facebook groups are, are incredibly culpable. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of people in groups that, that spring into action every time there's a mass shooting to spread the narrative that these are crisis actors. Um, YouTube is by far the worst offender on this front. Um, I think there has been a thriving underground culture of conspiracy theory videos on YouTube. Uh, some monetized, some not, that have been spreading the narrative that everyone from you know the parents of Sandy Hook, Aurora, you name it, every single mass shooting, this crisis actor nonsense starts up again, and the platforms do nothing. So I think that 
the challenge here is that we are now at a point where it is so eminently predictable that, you know, the same way that there's that funny, well, it's not funny at all, but the onion headline um, that they just, you know, recycle, recycle each time, we can at this point recycle the headlines about, about misinformation and disinformation campaigns because they are so predictable. And you can also recycle the narrative that the companies are going to come out with, which is, we don't want to be the arbiters of truth. It's too hard for us to detect this. Well, we gave them a strike. And this is where you know, we get to the point where we're actually uh, stuck in a rut. And the only thing that can get us out of this is the platforms taking responsibility for what they're hosting. So this is a great, uh, thank you for that transition. So I, I, Roger, I want you to talk about this, and there's been, uh, it was, that was a great transition because it led to the question I wanted to ask, but I want you to kind of do a little slicing and dicing here, right? That all of the, the social platforms, who were all invited to be on this panel, by the way, and all declined, notably, uh, when we said we wanted to talk about their response to this Russian problem and to the broader, the spread of fake news and conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of them are represented at this conference, but not on this panel. I, I'd like you to just talk with a little more granular detail about the difference between Facebook, uh, Twitter, Google, YouTube, Instagram, They've had, they're broadly similar in their reaction to the scrutiny they're under now, but there is difference, there are some differences in terms of how they're reacting to this new kind of public pressure to deal. So my reaction to their reaction is to recognize that each one of them is culpable in a different way. They each play a different role. So on the political front, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube stand forward relative to children Instagram, you know, YouTube, uh, Snapchat play a much, much greater role. And they have uniformly taken the position that they are protected by either Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act or something, some larger thing that they're a platform rather than a media company and therefore not responsible for what goes on, the, on, on their platforms. We're a newsstand, not a magazine. Well, I look at this and I, I think to myself, you know, if you were not running an uncontrolled social experiment on two, or psychological experiment on 2.1 billion people, I would be more open to that notion. Yeah. But 2.1 billion out of 7 billion is a social experiment that without a control group, without any protection, has produced really horrific outcomes. And it's easy to see how they got there, right? We went in 2000 from a world where you needed rocket scientists because we lived in a world of limited technology resources. Suddenly we had enough bandwidth processing power storage and all that in order to do whatever you wanted. So it was possible to hire companies of people fresh out of college without any experience. And they proceeded forward like they knew all the answers, like history didn't matter, like nothing that anyone else had ever experienced was relevant. And that they were free to act to disrupt, if you will, without being responsible for the consequences. And John, I think the answer to your question is, I believe they are all reacted horrifically, that they've done the bare minimum to appear to be responsive without actually doing anything substantive to do something about the problem. They all have all the tools they need, but for most of them, it's gonna require some change in their business model, some reprioritization, and that does not need to be harmful to them economically, but candidly at this point, I think they've lost the right to assert that this is too harmful to them. Right. You know, I think the harm they're doing in most cases is so great that, that we need to, as users, to put pressure on them. Right. So I wanna go, I'm, I wanna go, I really, want to, I really want to have enough time for some audience questions here, so I'm going to very quickly, I'm going to give you each like about a minute to answer the same question. I'm going to start down here, we'll move down the line, right? Okay, so this is a big problem. Um, on one end of the spectrum, there's government regulation. On the other end of the spectrum, there's self-regulation. In the middle somewhere is collaborative work between government and industry to solve this problem. If you had to sketch out what, not what you think is going to happen, but what you think should happen along that spectrum, what does that look like to you as we move towards 2018 where people are all freaked out that the midterms and we're gonna see just more of this, there's no reason not to think this is not gonna accelerate as opposed to decelerate on its own. What, what's the, again, along that spectrum, where do we need to get to? Well, I think uh, pragmatically by 2018, regulation is not gonna happen. Right, we'll uh, just, so yeah, yeah. I think, um, 
I think it's actually a lot of social pressure and media pressure that I, I think have really shifted the narrative over the last year. The fact that they did take down the most recent Parkland, uh, the, sorry, yeah, Parkland uh, crisis video um, is, is evidence that with the, with the sufficient amount of pressure, they will do something. Right, so, so, you, that up. so you see the greatest, chi the greatest, forget about the time frame, I was just using that as a sense of like, we know that there's gonna be more that's gonna happen, we're gonna be talking about this in six months, nine months, 12 months. You think that the model for how to fix this is mostly a market model, where, where public pressure on, the, on the, the, the private companies gets them to change without the government having to get involved in any significant way. It gets the most rapid change that I think means that 2018 will not be as much of a disaster as it's shaping up to be right now. Okay, uh, again, along the spectrum of regulation versus the market model, where do you think we should be? So I'm largely in the market model too, and I just want to give a couple of examples um, where I think that this can be effective. I mean, we are, and as it was discussed a little bit yesterday, seeing some really good examples of the private sector, um, you know, expanding the sort of thinking on corporate social responsibility, whether that's on climate change, whether that's standing up to the NRA. This is another area where I think that, in particular, because Facebook and Google are so dependent on advertising, um, where advertisers have a huge amount of leverage. And we saw Unilever two weeks ago, I believe, make an announcement that if um, the platforms don't, be, don't begin to actually address the problem um, that we are seeing, that they're gonna pull their advertising. And I think that that is actually the, the greatest source of leverage. Two other quick comments on this. Um, I come out of the foreign policy world, and so for me, some of the comments that one of the panelists on the Club de Madrid panel made yesterday about the implications of US government regulation on a worldwide scale, right. the way authoritarians could take advantage of this, I think is an enormously important point. I, I am very concerned about government overregulation. It's why I actually think it's so important for the companies to step up and take responsibility. Bill Gates recently made some points along this line. I think that um, collaborative mechanisms between the companies and with private researchers, I mean, there is an enormous amount of good work being done, but there is not collaboration in a way that provides either transparency or accountability or that actually lets researchers begin to help solve the problem. And the last point is, the you know, I was involved in, in the government when, um, during the Snowden um, revelations and saw the enormous rupture that happened with Silicon Valley during that point in time. We have got to close the trust gap between the, the Valley and government, particularly the intelligence community. This is not a challenge that can be solved by one or the other. It has to be done together in collaboration, and it is time that we actually recognize that. Roger. So two quick things. Relative to the election this year, the most important thing is that everyone vote. We need to set record turnout because the goal of these campaigns is to energize one side and then depress turnout on the other side. So if we maximize turnout, we beat this thing in the short run. It doesn't solve the problem, but it helps with 2018. Secondly, um, I'm very concerned about the market solving this. My goal is to appeal to the employees of these companies and say, which side of history do you want to be on? We're looking for Daniel Ellsberg. We're looking for Susan Fowler. Contact me. It is really important that we solve these problems from the inside. Do you want to be on the side of destroying democracy? Do you want to be on the side of destroying public health for our children? In which case, keep doing what you're doing. Otherwise, come and join us. And when Daniel Ellsberg uh, contacts you, <laughs> call me. Yeah. Um, we Chris, will create a legal yeah. defense fund. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. John. Yeah. Um, the one thing I'm shocked by is uh, at the last Web 2.0 uh, conference, you know, we had Yuri Milner on stage. Yuri Milner put $1.2 billion privately into Facebook and in Twitter. Those funds largely went to early investors, founders, Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey. We've got to get off this, we're good, they're bad, Rush is the bad actor. We're so fucking dirty in this as a community. I mean, I went to Twitter before they took that money and said, that is blood money. 165 journalists had been killed shot dead in Moscow and other places in Russia because mail.ru and all the information on that that Yuri Milner knew about was given to the Russian government so they could figure out who was trying to undermine them and they killed him. And we took that money. We all took that money. And we're sitting here now in 2018 saying, how did this happen? I love you, brother, but let's have a question. The question is, The Guardian has connected all of this. Yuri Milner got money directly from the Russian state, invested it in Facebook, invested it in Twitter, 
That went to the founders. You want to know why these guys aren't doing anything? Because they're dirty. And I think, Roger, you're just not saying it, but you know it. And we got to call truth. If we're going to get truth between our folks, and you're right, we have to have trust, we got to be honest about where the money's going and why. And Jared Kushner <laughs> was one of those investors, by the way. So Chris, Chris's question is, did, did Roger, would you like to call it bullshit right now <laughs> on anything? I thought that was an elegant That's it. statement. I was no, no need for a question. OK, uh, I got, let's, let's do these to two. Let's get them in quick. Thank you, John. Uh, Gordon Krovitz, I'm co-founder of NewsGuard, which is launching next week to be part of the solution to this problem. You talked a little bit about pressure points on Facebook and Google to get them to do the right thing. We heard users and advertisers. Is there any precedent of a previous problem that was this obvious, that was this hard for them to solve on their own, which understandably it is hard for them to solve on their own, where one of those interest groups was highly effective? Anybody got an answer to that? I, I'm not familiar with any problem that any of these companies have actually had to solve at any scale in the last five years. It's basically <laughs> been, no, I mean, it's been an express way with yeah. no pebbles on it. And I think part of the reason they've handled this so badly is they don't have the muscles for dealing with conflict. Is there an example of a similar, of a not a problem that these companies have had to solve in that time frame, but of an earlier kind of problem, either in the tech slash media space or in the history of publishing that's been, that, that presents this Well, to this be clear, the Tylenol situation for Johnson & Johnson provides actually an almost perfect example. And when I went to Facebook starting in October of 2016, I was pointing out to them, you guys could be heroes, right? You could be heroes in your own story. Yeah. And the key thing is to recognize that you do actually have an obligation to users. They are not fuel for your profits. They, you know, the reason Unilever is so angry is because they recognize that their customers are being harmed by this. Yeah. And they are advertising on this platform where they're being harmed. And eventually, all advertisers are going to look at this and go, what the hell are we doing? Um, next one up. Sorry, I just want to make sure we get this done because, again, we have another speaker. So, yes, sir. So, uh, someone on the panel alluded to this earlier, but, you know, uh, the point about actually apportioning blame or figuring out who's actually behind it, which to me sounds like the really scary part of it. So, uh, you know, if, if someone was doing this, uh, one way to do it would be to do it and make it look like someone else did it. And, and that becomes self-serving, whether it's, you know, President Trump saying it could be a 400-pound, you know, hacker in, their, in the basement, or Putin saying, well, it wasn't me, you know, it, it could be the Chinese, it could be someone else. Uh, and the, you know, the, the intelligence agencies who are telling us, well, these are the people who definitely did it, can't tell us exactly how they know because this is classified. Right. So are we at a point already, or could we be at a point in the future where uh, it would truly become possible or impossible to know who did it? Uh, you know, how, how good, how certain is the information and, you know, and, and will we ever reach that point, which would be truly scary? Well, I think attributability is a, has been a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge for the platforms. I think this actually speaks to Laura's point that uh, it, following the Snowden rift, there is not very much information sharing happening. I think that's very much a, a cultural thing. I, I've been um, doing some look, looking back on, on statements that people made related to ISIS and, sorry, I know we're uh, no, no, out of time, but... Um, I found some EFF, uh, you know, EF in the EFF archives, arguments that the tech industry needs to, um, that it's not the job of tech to detect terrorism on their platforms. And so you, you look at this sort of cultural conversation that's gone back years now, and I think what, we, what we're seeing is actually the kind of carry through of that attitude and, and the um, reluctance to take responsibility, the kind of passing the buck and pushing the blame, the fact that the intelligence agencies have some thoughts about it. The platforms have a phenomenal amount of information. There's no transparency. We have no insight at all uh, about anything that's happening in there because they have no outside research or relationships. We've been asking for this for months now, and, and we're not really getting anywhere. Roger, I will, uh, this, uh, I will be back to get off the stage right now. You asked a question at the top about the degree to which Facebook uh, worked with uh, various entities. Um, I don't think we, at this moment, know very much about uh, some of the interactions that they might have had with Russians. I will say this. Um, part of the reason why the Trump campaign was so much more successful, there was a great piece on Wired about this the other day, the Trump campaign was much more successful uh, because they understood Facebook better. Part of the reason they understood Facebook better is they did something that the Clinton campaign did not do, which is that they moved Facebook executives into the home of their digital advertising operation under the auspices of a gentleman named Brad Parscale. Um, today, Donald Trump announced that his new campaign manager in 2020 will be Brad Parscale. Thank you very much, guys. We're getting hey, off. I just want to know, if we get saved, John, these two are the ones who are going to do it, okay? <laughs> I'm serious.